I want to share with you all, I had this funny experience on the night of the Ohio and Texas primaries. Now you have to understand the background. Last year, in order to start working on the scale of change that I think we need, I developed an organization called American Solutions, and all of you have a handout that is the platform of the American people that comes from that organization. And I wrote a book last summer, which was published in February, called Real Change. And so I found myself on the night of the Ohio and Texas primaries, tuning in first to watch Senator Clinton, who was standing in front of a sign called Solutions for America, which I thought was a fairly pleasant copy of the title of our organization. And then we went over to watch Senator Obama standing behind a sign talking about change. And I thought to myself, they've at least got the words down. But what I want to share with you, and I think this is the core challenge of America, is that beyond the words is a real question of policy and a real question of values and a real question of seriousness. The words are easy. It's a little bit like Senator Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope. Well, hope is important. But beyond hope, there has to be real achievement. And real achievement requires hard work. And it requires applying the right principles. And I would suggest it requires real change. Senator Obama pointed out that, that he had worked for years on the south side of Chicago. He'd been an activist in social reform. And yet, that is the very area that Oprah Winfrey cited when she was asked on 60 Minutes why she had opened a girls' school in South Africa. And she said because she had given up on trying to open a school like that on the south side of Chicago. And it, to me, it was a very chilling and sobering moment to realize that somebody who'd done extraordinarily well in America, somebody who cared deeply about people, had literally found it almost impenetrable to try to change a culture and a situation that had turned out to be destructive. So I want to take up the opportunity that Senator Obama described yesterday in opening up a dialogue. Because I think that we do need a dialogue about race and poverty in America. But I think it isn't necessarily the dialogue that the left wants or that the left expects. Because I think that there are hard facts it is a hard fact that the Detroit school system cheats three out of every four children. It's one of the most expensive school systems in the United States, and about one out of every four kids actually gets through school on time and graduates on time. Three out of four are denied that opportunity by that system. It is a hard fact that Detroit in 1950 had a million eight hundred thousand people, and today has less than 900,000. Over half their housing stocks not needed. It is the first major American city to drop below a million in the history of the United States. <clears throat> it went from the highest per capita income in the United States in 1950 to 62nd in per capita income. And I would assert that what no one on the left wants to debate or discuss or consider is that it is the institutions and the values of the left which have in fact destroyed jobs, driven away opportunity, crippled children, and ended up in situations where there are entire neighborhoods without hope, entire neighborhoods without opportunity, entire neighborhoods without education. And no one wants to take this seriously. They either want to feel bad about it, but do nothing or they want to ignore it because they know they're not going to do anything. That, that's the right and left in American politics in the last 30 years. The left felt bad, but because the problems were caused by their allies, they couldn't do anything about it. And the right decided it was hopeless, so they wouldn't even want to think about it. And so in Detroit, for example, in 2002, an entrepreneur who was quite successful offered to put up $200 million in order to create charter schools, and was promptly attacked as a white racist interfering with the black power structure uh, and inappropriately trying to mess up what's going on in Detroit. And so in a system which was cheating three out of four children, they turned down $200 million because it threatened their power structure. And no one wants to have this conversation. 
In Philadelphia, more people have been killed per capita than any other major city in the U.S. 3,000 people have been murdered since 1988. And the judges in Philadelphia refuse to lock up criminals. And if you don't control, people on the left want to talk about gun control. If you don't control the criminals, it doesn't matter much what you do about guns, because the criminals figure out how to get guns illegally. And yet I don't find, now that we have a Pennsylvania primary, either Senator Obama or Senator Clinton prepared to go to Philadelphia and suggest that there's a lot to learn from Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani applied a new model of policing called CompStat for computer statistics. He applied a metrics-based model of management. And the end result was crime was reduced in New York by 75%. It is the safest big city in the United States per 1,000 people. But it was a fundamental real change. Because the fact is that when you go and look at New York, the first year, three out of every four precinct captains either resigned or retired. Because when they were faced with this new model, they decided either they couldn't do it or they wouldn't do it. And Giuliani decided that whoever was going to be precinct captain would do it, and therefore they went through a wrenching, painful process of change. Yet I hear no one suggesting in Philadelphia that we go through the level of change necessary to save the number of lives. If you reduced murder in Philadelphia to the New York rate, you would save the lives of hundreds of people in the next few years. And by reducing crime, you make it possible for businesses to open up. And when businesses open up, they hire people. And when they hire people, they have opportunity. And they have income. And they can buy a house. Now, no one on the left is prepared to go in to Detroit and have a debate about the last 50 years in Detroit. No one on the left is prepared to go to the south side of Chicago. I think it would be terrific for Senator McCain to say to Senator Obama, I want to take up your challenge. Let's go stand in the middle of south side Chicago and talk about what isn't working. Because in almost every instance, what isn't working are the institutions of the left. And this is a core moment in American history. If we flinch and we are afraid to have this dialogue, if we flinch and we are afraid to stand toe to toe, and as Lady Thatcher once said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. So let's take the, the great battle cry in Ohio during the primary. How do you create jobs in Ohio? Let me tell you, it's not complicated. You have litigation reform, you have regulation reform, you cut taxes, you reduce the burden of government, you make it profitable to open up businesses in Ohio, and guess what? You'll have jobs in Ohio. This is not, now getting it done is complicated, but what everybody on the left wants to know is, how can I have all of my trial lawyer friends happy suing people? How can I have all of my government bureaucrats happy getting higher salary and hiring more people? How can I issue more regulations? How can I have contempt for the business community? And by the way, how can I create jobs in that environment? The answer is you can't. That's what happened in Michigan. Michigan had under John Engler, the last Republican governor, the lowest unemployment rate in its history as a state, 3.3%. It had a triple-A bond rating, so it was borrowing money for infrastructure at the lowest possible cost. Within two years, a left-wing governor and a left-wing legislature raised taxes, created bureaucracy, expanded government, drove business out, had a deeply anti-business attitude, and it became the, the only state in the country that had a recession without a hurricane. It was an extraordinary achievement, which nobody on the left wants to look at. And it wasn't about the auto industry. Grand Rapids is actually growing at a time when Detroit is collapsing. But it does require change. And it requires people who are prepared to go out and apply new ideas. Now let me give you a sense of the scale of change. Because I want you to understand, I'm not talking about small, minor things. I don't think gimmicks and quick fixes make any long-term uh, difference. I think we need to talk about what does it take for America to compete with China and India? What does it take for every young American to truly be endowed by their creator with the right to pursue happiness? What does it take to ensure that every young American has an opportunity to get a real education and to be capable of competing in the world market? These are fundamental changes. Let me give you a simple standard. How many of you have ever gone online to track a package at UPS or FedEx? Just raise your hand if you've ever gone online. Okay. Virtually the entire audience. So, so this, is, um, this is not a theory, right? And I say this for the following reason. You'll occasionally read in the news media, Gingrich has interesting ideas, but after all, we have to be practical. 
It is a practical fact that a market-oriented, science and technology-based entrepreneurial company that makes a capital investment in information technology can apply the, the lessons of lean thinking and Six Sigma and, and Drucker and Duran and, and Womack and Deming. And as a result, UPS tracks 15 million packages a day and FedEx package, tracks 8 million packages a day while they're moving. I describe that in my, in my new book, Real Change, as the world that works. And all of you know this because you, you use it. Now over here is the world that fails. Take the Department of Homeland Security. In the world that works, we can track 23 million packages while they move. In the world that fails, we can't find 10 million people who are here illegally, even if they're sitting still. <laughs> so one of my policy proposals has been to allocate about $200 million, send a package to everyone who's here illegally. <laughs> When UPS and FedEx find them, you deliver the package. And <laughs> now, at one level, you know I'm exaggerating. Let me, let me take this down to practicality. Most big city schools care very much who shows up the first day because that's where they establish their baseline for, for getting paid all year. I don't know if this is true in Ohio or not. It was true in Indiana. And then they actually don't care who shows up because they already got paid based on the baseline attendance. I want to recommend you, if you want, look at McDonald's, if you look at Walmart, they have every night reporting because they have an investment in infrastructure. In Walmart, they actually can track in real time every purchase in the entire system. So what if you gave every teacher a BlackBerry and you had them take attendance every, at every class session and you actually had reporting in real time every hour and you knew who was in school and who wasn't in school? In many of the biggest cities, you'd suddenly find out you're paying teachers to pay one-third the number of teachers. I mean, people talk about class size. They have no idea what the real class size is because they never look at the attendance. You'd suddenly, my hunch is you would save enough money on finding out who's not there. You'd pay for the Blackberries the first day. But it's a totally different model. It's a real-time, highly transparent, very accountable, stunningly inexpensive information-based model. Let me give you a second example. This I got directly from Sarkozy when he ran for president. And by the way, I think Sarkozy's election last year is, it was the most optimistic sign that John McCain can win this fall. Because Sarkozy was a center-right politician serving in the Chirac government when Chirac had been president for 12 years. And everybody expected that a, a socialist was going to win the election. And Sarkozy became the candidate of change even while serving in the cabinet. And the end result was people said, I want real change, he's real change. Segalene Royale, the socialist, was a reactionary propping up the bureaucracy and the unions. And in the end, they decided, if I want real change, I have to be for Sarkozy. And so they elected a, a center-right president at a time when nobody would have expected it. Well, let me give you an, an example of real change. Sarkozy was faced with the fact that France has a 35-hour work week. He campaigned on three, three platform planks. First, you can come to France, but you have to learn to be French. Second, he said, I will enforce the law. This isn't a country where last year 15,000 cars were burned by young thugs who were unemployed and thought if they didn't have a car, you shouldn't have one either. And it turned out that the middle class really was irritated at having their cars burned. Uh, and so the idea of enforcing the law was very popular. Uh, and he said, third, now think about this as a campaign slogan. He said, the French will have to work harder. Now, can you imagine an American candidate for president saying, vote for me and you'll get to work harder? But he won the core argument. He said, look, before Margaret Thatcher, the French economy was 25% bigger than Great Britain. Today, the British economy is 10% bigger than France. Today, there are 300,000 young Frenchmen and women working in London because it's a better place to work than Paris. We are losing purchasing power, which means we're going to lose taxes, which means we're not going to be able to sustain the pension and the health system. And they had a 35-hour work week. But he was very clever. He was, he was much more like Ronald Reagan than like a traditional Republican. And Reagan had been an FDR Democrat. Sarkozy didn't say, let's, end, let's abolish the 35-hour work week. That would have led to a civil war with the left. 
You said, fine, keep the 35 hour work week. But if you are prepared to work more than 35 hours, there should be no tax on your overtime. Now notice the fight he just set up. He just said, I want to allow you to earn everything you earn over 35 hours a week so you get it in take home pay. And by the way, it's better for France. So would you like the money in your budget and would you like France to be better? Now my opponents on the left don't want you to have the money and they don't want to have help for France. Now he just turned, he just created patriotic greed. And people could say, well, as long as it's helping France, I'll keep the money. <laughs> this, by the way, is what Reagan did in 1980. Reagan ran on the grounds that Jimmy Carter had so destroyed the economy that we needed a 30% tax cut in order to restart the economy. And he said, you may not personally need a 30% tax cut, but for the country, would you accept it? <laughs> and millions of Americans said, well, I personally don't care, but if you think it'll help America, who am I to turn the money down? Now, let me bring that back home here. I'm going to offer you a very radical idea, which I don't recommend that Steve campaign on, but I want you to think about. There was a report last week that 26% of American teenage girls have a sexually transmitted disease, every fourth girl, over half in the African American community. We have methamphetamine, we have teenage gangs, we have 16 year olds being killed, we have drug dealers. I just want to suggest to you, these are not symptoms of success. And I want to suggest that maybe we better rethink adolescence as a model. Because maybe the model that says teenagers ought to be bored, trapped in schools that don't succeed, blocked from going to work, and then have a, have a 13 year old male with a 15 year old mentor, which has got to be the dumbest social structure in history. I mean, the idea that young males learn from young males is absolutely dumb. And what does it lead to? It leads to what the mess I just described. So let me offer you just, just one or two quick examples. I, I go to, I, I went back to West Georgia University, and I taught a freshman class last fall when we did Solutions Day at the university. We had 60 students in the class. The youngest was 16. And I said, how many of you know somebody in high school who cheated. Every hand went up. It's been this way, by the way, for 30 years. I've, I've always asked this question, uh, and every hand has gone up every time except once. I had one girl who was in a Catholic school where there were nine students and a nun. And she said, to the best of her knowledge, there was zero cheating. <laughs> Otherwise, they've always raised their hand. I then said, how many of you, if we had a bonus, think about the, this for the state. If we had a bonus that if you got through school in three years, you could take the cost of the fourth year as an automatic scholarship, how many of you could have gotten through in three years? Every single hand went up. Every single hand. 60 hands. I said, how about two years? Half the hands went up. I said, all right. How about one year? Kid in the back of the room yells, how big is the bonus? <laughs> Now, I'm trying to drive at a point here about enforced bureaucratic boredom. And let me offer you an alternative model for a minute. What if you said, if, if, if your choice is dropping out of school and doing nothing, or working, anything you earn under 16, at 16 or under, is tax free. So you take, you get 100% of it. So you say to poor children in very poor neighborhoods, if you'll do honest work, you actually get the money. And you compete head on with drug dealing, prostitution, and pimps as a way of life. Second, an experiment my daughter is running for a foundation in Atlanta, we've actually gone to two of the poorest schools in Atlanta, and we're paying the children the equivalent of working at McDonald's to study. And we've just said flatly, we, we know what works in America. You know what's gonna work for the baseball team, for the football team. You know what's gonna work for rock stars and movie stars. You know what works at law firms. Somehow it comes back to money. 
And then we say, gosh, we have this terrible problem with poor children who don't have any money. They have no incentives. They have no structure of support for learning. Gosh, I wonder what would work. And if you say, well, why do, what if we transferred over the model we use in baseball? And said, you know, if you could do calculus when you're 11, you get more money. If you do physics at 12, you get more money. If you decide you don't want to do that and you're 13 or 14 or 15, you want to work part time. I talked to a first generation billionaire yesterday whose first job was at nine. I talked to a guy worth a couple hundred million in Atlanta last year who at 12 was selling newspapers and at 14 had four other kids working for him. But what do we say to poor children in poor neighborhoods? They have, no, they have no experience of work. They have no one around to mentor them in success. So I, I just want to say, I think Senator Obama, if we have the nerve to take him up on it, has opened up a very interesting dialogue. But it's a dialogue where if we're serious about every child in America having the right to pursue happiness as they were endowed by their creator, we're going to talk about very fundamental change. And it's going to get to be a very interesting year. And it's going to involve a lot more honest, open conversation than anybody on the left is prepared for. And it's going to be about the hard work of achievement, not just the audacity of hope. And it's going to be about turning hope into reality by adopting new policies, creating new institutions, and doing new things. Let me, let me close by saying I hope you'll look at the platform of the American people. We developed it through 100,000 people at Solutions Day, through 25,000 people, more than 25,000 people in telephone town hall meetings, and through six national polls. We had a very specific goal. We wanted to find issues that were tripartisan. Instead of red versus blue, we were looking at red, white, and blue. And when I say tripartisan, I mean everything in the platform of the American people has a majority of Republicans, a majority of Democrats, and a majority of independents. And I'll just give you two quick examples. 87% of the American people believe English should be the official language of government. Now that's an absolute majority of Democrats who believe English should be the official language of government, as well as an absolute majority of Republicans and independents, as well as an absolute majority of Latinos. Second, 84% of the American people believe they should have the option of a flat tax with a single page form as an alternative to what you're about to go through before April 15th. 84%. And here's our proposition at American Solutions. What if the two political parties adopted, as part of their platform, a series of planks that virtually everybody in America believes in? And what if they agreed that for the first 90 days of 2009, no matter who wins, we'll focus on things we actually agree on and create a habit in Washington of getting a lot done because, the, because we carefully focus on things we can agree on. And we're continuing to evolve this. We're going to add a section on health. We're going to add some more sections this summer. But I think if you look at it, you'll see a country which adopted these kind of continuous changes would in fact be a dramatic country that was doing a lot of good stuff where you could have faith in your government again. It's not the same as a second contract with America, but it is a step in the direction of beginning to shape a second contract and I think you'll find it a very useful thing. And I urge you to go to American Solutions and to look at what we're doing there. The last thing I'll say is that I, am, I do a weekly newsletter. If you're interested in, in getting it, you can just go to my first name. It's newt.org. And it comes out every week in terms of ideas, sometimes twice a week. Uh, it's free. Uh, but I came out here in part to help Steve because I think this campaign does matter. I also came out in part because Cincinnati has always been a center a very strong entrepreneurial, business-oriented republicanism that had a solid common sense approach that focused on developing new solutions and new ideas. There's a deep streak of practical problem-solving republicanism that grows out of the Cincinnati experience for the last hundred years. And I wanted to come and say to each of you personally, I think we have an opportunity to create real change I think the way to create that real change is to look at solutions that are based on the American experience. I think if we do those things, we can compete with China and India, we can defeat Al-Qaeda and the irreconcilable wing of Islam, 
and we can give all of our children of every ethnic background in every neighborhood a genuine opportunity to pursue happiness. And that is what they were endowed by their creator with. And I think the challenge to our generation is to take on the opportunity to have this dialogue, to reach out to every single person in this county and give every single person a chance to be part of that dialogue. And I think you may be very surprised by October at how different that dialogue is than anybody could imagine this spring. Thank you all very, very much. Good job, man. That's great. That was great. Yeah, it really was.